Praise God. Our subject tonight is our fourth lesson, and the topic is God, and of course there couldn't be any more important doctrine uh, lesson for us to discuss than the very existence of God and who God is. So let's speak about God tonight. In context, what we like to say first up in regards to God is that God doesn't ever attempt to prove his existence. Uh, if, if God was a man, he would do all sorts of things like we do to demonstrate who we are and what we are and so forth, but God doesn't. God simply affirms his existence. He does not attempt to prove the truths of the Bible. He does not attempt to prove the fact that he exists. He does not argue with the human family. God simply affirms. He makes a statement. And I wonder if you can tell me where one of the most important statements about this affirmation of God may be found. Where do you think? Whereabouts in the Bible would you look for a statement? Yeah. In Genesis, that's a very good place to start, in fact, in the very beginning, right? And if you turn right there to the very first verse of your Bible, in fact, turn there and read it out loud for me, because this is significant. Please, Sister Jen, if you will. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, this is where our history begins. It's not God's history, but this is where our history begins, or at least the history of the world as we know it. And God doesn't go into a lot of explanation, as you can see. In fact, He doesn't explain at all. He doesn't say, okay, let's see, just so you know who I am, I came from here, I did this, or... He doesn't introduce himself, he doesn't say anything about himself, he doesn't attempt to demonstrate or to prove or to give any evidence at all, because he is God and he doesn't need to. The evidence will be self-evident by what he has created, as we will see tonight. But basically, God simply affirms, in the beginning, God, in the very first verse of our Bible, that is the revelation of God as we have studied, what God through His Spirit has given as a letter to humans, and it has been given by inspiration of God, God Himself simply affirms. As I said, if it was us, we would try to somehow demonstrate, bring evidence and supportive evidence, because we need to demonstrate our word. But God does not. God is His own testimony. And God, in His own manner, has a way of simply stating, and what God says is fact. In the beginning, God are the opening words of your Bible, and this simply announces the existence of God. There is no further reference before or after. We know from our studies, God is eternal, and we'll have a look at the attributes of God as we go on in our lessons, and we will see that as a result of this, there is absolutely no need for God any more than just to affirm and to state that God is So, let's have a look now in Romans chapter 1, if you will turn there with me, and we'll have a look at at how else God states or declares that this knowledge of Him is present. We're reading Romans chapter 1. This is probably one of the most important passages when it comes to the general understanding that God simply is. The statement begins in verse 19, as you can read there with me, 19 and 20. In those two verses, the scripture says this. It says, because that which may be known of God. Now, it doesn't say that we can know God in every way, right? But what can be known of God is what? Manifest. What does the word manifest mean? Anyone? Yeah, Brother Gordon. Revealed. Revealed. Open. Obvious for everyone to see. It's it's made open, available for everyone to see. We're reading in Romans, the first chapter, verse 19, if you're still looking for it. Because that which may be known of God is open, it's made manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. So God is saying here, I didn't go to prove and give you a whole list of long evidences and proofs, but what can be known of me, I have shown it to you. Okay, how can it be seen? Have a look. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are what? Now say clearly seen. Because this is an important aspect. A lot of people say, if I could see God you know, with my eyes, then I would believe in God. Meanwhile, God is saying, what can be known of the invisible God is clearly seen. In what though? Not in the fact that we can see God as a spirit, but in the evidences of what God has done. It's interesting that the same people who would tell you that they would only believe in God if they can see Him with their own eyes, uh, have no problem believing, say, in the wind. You can't see the wind, per se. It's air. It's invisible. But you can see it by the effects of the wind. And nobody would doubt that the wind exists. Have you ever seen electricity? Think about it. 
Uh, the only way you see it is through the effects of the electricity flowing through a globe and lighting up, and we know it exists. The other way you know is if you touch it, you know it exists. But you can't see it, per se, unless there is some effect of it. So this argument that unless this particular senses, one of our five senses, is the only way that we can evidence the existence of God is, is fairly weak when you think about it. Because we accept the existence of many other things via our other senses. And on top of that, God is saying the invisible things of God, of Him, from the creation are clearly seen. They're evidenced in the creation. Okay? And then it says, being understood by the things that are made, even is eternal power and Godhead. And then he adds this, in case we've got it any way wrong, he says, so that they, humans, are without excuse. So when finally a human stands before God and says, oh, but God, I couldn't see you, that's why I couldn't believe in you, what will God say to him from this verse? Yes, Sister Hazel. No excuse, because the invisible things of me, from the creation of the world, were clearly seen. I showed it unto you in all the things that were made. The things that surround you are evidence of the invisible God. So get this, the visible world around us is evidence of the invisible God. So if you can see, if you can touch, if you can feel, if you exist, you have evidence of the invisible self-existing God. Isn't that beautiful? And so the scripture says that man is without excuse, and I don't think that it's going to hold up on the day of judgment to say, oh, sorry, I couldn't see you, God, so I couldn't believe in you, because God said, I have showed it unto you, it is clearly seen by the things that are made. Praise God. All right, so we know, therefore, that God does not attempt to prove his existence. All right, so let me ask a question then. Should we as Christians attempt to prove the existence of God? Because a lot of people will ask you, say, well, you know, how do you know that God even exists? The fact is this, that ultimately, whilst there are many evidences, and we will give you tonight many arguments for the existence of God, the belief that God is comes down to each one of us individually. And that's why for us individually, we'll have to give account to God. Now, we can give you many rational reasons, all sorts of scientific reasons and many arguments, as you'll see tonight, from all sorts of fields of science and the world and around us that God exists. And there's really very little logical reasons to refute those facts. But the fact is that unless a person ultimately chooses to believe, you can never say, here is God in a physical sense to prove. And therefore, if that's what they're looking for, well, you're not going to be able to prove it anyway. Brother Gordon. I remember years ago I had this problem with, you know, why doesn't God show himself to people? Yes. And uh, I remember somebody saying to me, well, look at the scriptures. Yeah. It, it, it said, and, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact scripture, but, you know, like even when people saw him, but still some didn't believe. And I want you to notice that if God was to appear right now in front of some people, there would still be the doubters. Mm-hmm. There would still be some and say, well, how do I know you're really God? And where do you come from? And there would be still the very same questions. So you see, God doesn't even go there. And we don't really need to go there, except that we do have many areas of demonstration apart from our own experiences. And we'll cover that in a moment uh, as we get into our lesson. So in context, God doesn't attempt to prove his existence. And in that sense, whilst we can affirm, we can demonstrate logical reasons, ultimately the appeal is to this, an innate faith. What do you think this means? What is an innate faith? Yes, Deb. Naturally occur. It means inborn. It is born with us. How do we know that this is the fact? Well, man everywhere believes in the existence of a supreme being. When people begin to travel away from what we would call the civilized world, for instance, into far remote areas where Christianity, the teaching of the Bible, and God had never reached. You know what they found? They found that man in whatever context, in whatever tribe, in whatever part of the world they lived, still worshipped a God. There was something within a faith innate, there was something within the human being of whatever country, in whatever manner, that required, there was a necessity to worship a supreme being. This innate faith is something we can appeal to because it's something within each one of us that naturally tells us God is. If one can reason or think 
then one must believe. The logical conclusion of you being alive and existing is that God is. Because we cannot be self-existing, someone has created us. And you could say, oh yeah, but that was my mom and dad. And then you'd say, well, then someone created them. And you go back to the grandpa. And you could keep doing this for years. And finally, when you go back right down to Adam and Eve, the very, very first people that existed on earth, you have to go to who made them. And finally, you come back to God and his creation. So the very existence of the world around us, our own existence, tells us that, in fact, we have a... A creator, and there is this something inside of us that tells us it's inborn, it's inbred, it, we, we're born with it. Have you noticed, for instance, that children have no resistance at all in believing in God? It's quite natural for them to pray. In fact, many times it takes very little teaching for them to understand that there's a God and that, that God is. There is this natural ability. But what's beautiful is everywhere that man exists, there is this recognition that a supreme being exists and that he must be worshipped. And what's more, what we find is that not only there is a knowledge or an innate faith that a supreme being exists, but that man is morally responsible to this being. Now, of course, not everybody believes in the true God, but everyone does believe in a God. And I want to point out to you that even individuals who deny the existence of God deify certain things or certain aspects of their lives. Sometimes they deify their own selves or their own knowledge or their own understanding. Some people deify science and consider this the epitome, the topest, the best that man can have. The fact is, ultimately, there is a need deep inside each one of us to worship a supreme being. This belief is innate in man and it comes from a rational or logical intuition. Somebody turn up uh, John 4.22 for me. Someone else please. Acts 17.23. What we want to say by this statement is that ultimately everybody worships something. You can count on that even if people deny the existence of God. And there are those that do as we'll study tonight. But everyone worships something. The two scriptures John 4.22 and Acts 17.23. There they are on the board. The belief is innate and it comes from rational intuition. Who's got um, John 4.22? Please, Sister Bernie, at the back. Thank you. Okay, so if you remember the statement here of Jesus was that you worship, you know not what, but we know whom we worship. So the Jews had a knowledge of the one true God, but Jesus was saying to the Samaritan woman, you don't know who you worship. So it is possible, in fact it is very commonplace, that many worship but they don't really know who they're worshipping. They may have a name, they may have a statue that represents their deity, they may have something that ultimately is their idol, but in their mind this represents a supreme being. It's not necessarily the correct God, but I want you to notice the necessity to worship. And, and so that scripture demonstrates it. What about Acts 17.23? We find the Apostle Paul, please draw out loud, here at Athens. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. The Athenians the people of Greece had gods of all kinds. They were polytheistic in nature, meaning they had many, many gods. And they worshipped a god for just about everything. And in case they had forgotten a god, they made an altar even to the unknown god. So there was an actual altar, and they couldn't depict anything on it. It was just an altar, and it was inscripted to the unknown god. Just in case they'd forgotten someone, and they didn't want to offend any of the deities, their gods. And so when Paul saw this, he took this as the opportunity to say, the God who you worship ignorantly, I'm going to present him to you. This is the one true God, is the God that has created everything. And of course, from there, he began to speak the truth about God, and many were converted eventually in that very place. But can you see that people can worship God ignorantly, or at least they can worship a deity without knowing who they're, whom they're really worshipping. This innate faith we're speaking of, there is a need inside each of us to worship, and remember the key words, everybody worships something or someone. It's not hard for us to believe that today. You only have to look at the way that a lot of young people in the world worship the stars, meaning not the stars in the heaven, but the movie stars and the, uh, you know, the music stars and what have you. They look up to these people as their idols. I believe that's even a terminology that is used in order to describe them. 
when Satan comes to challenge men's faith, it is at this very level that he always challenges, at this faith, innate faith within us. That's where he wants to cast doubt. There is a natural faith that wants to believe. The question mark is, does God really exist the way you feel inside? So the struggle between faith and unbelief is as old as man himself. And so it is here that man's uh, faith begins. In fact, what does the Bible say about faith? How does it come and how do we maintain it? What does the scripture say about this? Faith cometh? Yeah. So, hearing. Hearing. And hearing from the Word of God. So as long as God's Word has been reaching man's ears, faith has been in his heart. But at the same time, we've had an enemy, Satan, who's trying to rob man of faith, and he's proposing all sorts of other ideologies, philosophies, and concepts to rob us of our natural faith, the innate faith that God has put within us. But Hebrews 11 and 6 says something very important that we need to remember. So please turn that up with me. Yeah, please, Michelle, out loud. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward. Okay, without faith, it is impossible to please him. We need faith. And God has put the measure of faith within each individual, the ability to believe. Remember that scripture says, the measure of faith? Okay, not a measure, but the measure. It is put a ability to believe within every single individual. Now, what we do with that innate faith is purely up to us. We can let Satan rob us of that innate faith and not use it for God or begin to place it towards other things or other people, or we can begin to diligently seek God. It says, He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Keep that scripture very much in mind when you're witnessing, because anyone who will come to God and diligently seek God will find reward in the Lord. Okay, so we have a God who affirms, I'm here. And so it's a case of, will you believe me or not? I've given you the ability to believe, what will you do with it? This innate faith is what a gift of God to every human being. And what we do with it is obviously going to result in either eternal life, or eternal loss. All right then, so let's define some terms to understand those that do believe and those that believe in part, those that don't believe at all. So if we're saying specifically a believer in God, the correct terminology is a theist. Theos is the Greek word for God. And so if you're a believer in God, you're a theist, meaning you believe in, in the true God, in the one true God. Of course, we are completely convinced that the one true God is Jesus, that's his New Testament name. Yahweh is his Old Testament name. But there are other individuals, and uh, I want you to see these terminologies. An infidel, for instance, is an individual who disbelieves in some religion, especially Christianity. So, an individual who does not believe in Christianity, but really who generally does not believe in religion in itself, can be termed an infidel. Now, of course, as you appreciate, uh, Muslims, those that uh, follow the Islamic faith, state that anyone who doesn't follow the Islamic faith is an infidel. So that includes you and I. But we would say quite the opposite. We would say that we're believers in Christ, and so we are true theists. We believe in the one true God. So please remember, an infidel is one who disbelieves in some religion, especially Christianity. Then we have a skeptic. What do you think a skeptic is? Uh, Gordon, yeah? Who always question. questions. That's the key. A skeptic is an individual who takes a questioning attitude towards religion. Okay, now if you remember, interestingly by the way, that's exactly the attitude that Satan brought into humanity at the very beginning. Remember that? It caused man to question God. And this is where faith is being undermined. In each one of these positions that we'll see here on the board tonight, the innate faith that God has given freely to man to use towards God to accept the visual world that he has created so that we can see clearly the invisible God is undermined by each one of these techniques that Satan has brought into the world. And so a skeptic takes a questioning attitude. Is it really so? Uh, many songs and many things have been written questioning what God says, questioning his word. And by questioning, sufficient doubt is 
cast upon that which is of God, so that people feel justified in not believing. Here's another one for you, an agnostic. And then you might tell me what an agnostic is. Yes, Bernie. Okay, very good. He neither affirms or denies the existence of God. In other words, he can't make up his mind. He's a guy that's sitting on the fence, literally. He says, yeah, I think he could exist, or but then again, maybe he doesn't. Okay? So he's certainly not a theist, is he? Because he, he does not firmly believe in God. He's not a believer. And again, this is a, another technique that Satan uses, is by causing people to sit on the fence. They're neither for God, but neither are they against. Now, you may be surprised to learn that a lot of people fall into this category today. For instance, some individuals have no problem going to church and having a little bit of God. But here is the condition. Don't get too serious about God. Don't get too deep into God. And they'll believe that, oh, you know, it's nice to sing hymns and and it gives you a great feeling to be together in church, perhaps, but you can't really live your life according to the principles of God. In other words, they neither affirm nor they deny the existence of God. They don't really live for God, but they don't necessarily live against Him either. They, they're generally speaking good people in their own minds. <laughs> they don't really believe the Word of God and live by those principles, but neither do they turn right against it or deny it. Brother Bill? They're not hot or cold. Okay, now what does the Bible say about that? And that's a very good point. They're neither hot or cold, they're lukewarm, and that mixture is pretty sickening to God. God would rather see that a person takes a very firm stand with their faith. Remember, innate faith, God-given gift of God to use towards God. Brother Gordon. I don't believe in God, don't confess anything. And then you say, when they're sick, I'll pray for you. And yeah. Say, yeah, that's it. And that's the sort of, they neither affirm nor deny. They sort of take a little bit of what suits them, but they will not live for God. Here's another one for you. Now, this one you know rather well. What's an atheist? What does he do? He denies, he denies the existence of God. He totally denies it. Notice a theist. If you separate the two words, theist means a believer in God. Whenever you put a in the Greek in front of a word, right, then you mean the opposite. A non-theist. That's what the a means. A non-theist. Okay, so he does not believe in the existence of God. In fact, he denies the existence of God. And there are many individuals who outwardly will deny the existence of God. But what is interesting is they can't help themselves. I've actually heard many, many an atheist swear and use the name of the Lord in vain. And you think, uh, well, why would you do that if you don't even believe that God exists? We'll come back to the atheist because the Bible has somewhat to say about him. But here's another one for you, a pantheist. These individuals essentially identify the entire universe, including themselves, including humans, as God. But they deny the personality of God. And this is what what is important to remember with pantheists. And by the way, the same uh, concept, theist, notice God, pan means universal or whole, if you please. And so what the pantheist believes is that everything is God. Animals, nature, humans, everything is God, because God is in everything, so therefore everything is God. However, God does not have a personality of his own, so he only shows his personality through in creation or in that which is universally out there visibly. Today, particularly nowadays, pantheism has become very, very, very popular. With New Age culture, uh, pantheism, as which is really an Eastern type of thinking, it's rife everywhere. And people will say something like, oh, well, you know, you worship God the way you see fit, and I worship God, but God is everywhere. We all worship the same God. And they could be talking about anything. It does, God is not Jesus any longer. God is not the personality of the Bible. It's not the God of the Bible they're referring to, but just anyone and anywhere and everything is God. And so they will sound spiritual. They will say things that sound godly in the sense of believing, but it's nothing to do with the true God. So please be careful of these errors, because whilst Satan has used these very uh, techniques to lure people away from their innate faith, away from God, they are also today being introduced in the background into the minds of true believers. There are many Christians 
who hold to some of the theories of pantheism and some of the outlooks of agnostics. In, in fact, there are some who, though they say they believe in God, they're actually quite atheist altogether when it comes to the reality of their relationship with God. So we've got to be careful that we don't fall into these pitfalls. Are you with me thus far? What does the Bible say about the atheist? And let's have a look at this. This is the biblical description of an atheist. Turn it with me, please. Psalm 14 and 1. And when a person says, nah, there is no God, and notice whether he says it with his mouth or even believes it in his heart, what does the Bible call him or her? Have a look what the scripture says. Psalms 14 and verse 1. Somebody read it out, please. Please, Jeanette, if you will, sister. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When an individual says it, whether he says it to himself in his own heart or whether he pronounces it with his mouth, the Bible calls this person a fool. By description, he is without the ability to think. That's really what a fool is, unable to think rationally. And so, here is the definition, therefore. If somebody can think rationally, they must believe. It's interesting, isn't it, that in context, therefore, there is rarely what you would call a true atheist. There are many professed atheists, but when the chips are down, many of such individuals do have some kind of belief. And as Brother Gordon says many times, when they're on the deathbed or in some sort of trouble, they know how to raise a prayer to the God that they claim does not exist. In any case, whether they are true or just merely professed, to deny that there is a God is to state that the very root of human nature is a lie. It's to state that we don't exist because we are the product of someone that is self-existing. And this is one of the arguments that we'll see in a minute to actually demonstrate the existence of God. So God has wrote this truth of himself in the very grain and fiber of human nature. And so to say God doesn't exist is to say I don't exist. Is to say that the visual world around you doesn't exist. Can you see why God says a person that says that has to be a fool? He must not be able to reason rationally. And yet today we have some of the most intelligent individuals in the sciences of the world stating there is no God. Well, if we measure by the Bible standard, these most intelligent individuals are also great, the greatest fools. Because the very rationale by which they say that they exist, or that life around them exists, demonstrates the existence of God. Now, there are some pretty sad results when one denies God. When one says there is no God. You know, just in the same manner that God blesses and cleanses and uplifts and and sanctifies the believer. The opposite is true. When a person removes God, and we have, by the way, we have removed God out of our schools, out of our law, we have removing God out of everything, and we take this more agnostic sort of impersonal God viewpoint. When this happens, this is the result that will happen in our society. We will have a breakdown in morals, in standards. And uh, if you uh, read the rest of Romans chapter 1, you remember that we read in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and 20, we read that what can be known of God can be seen and learned and is clearly seen by that which is visible, by creation itself. Okay? But then, have a look what happened. When man started to deny God. Read in verse 21 with me, please. Okay, so this is Romans 1 and verse 21. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful. What is happening here? Well, man knew God, but he denies the existence of God. So he's starting to put God aside. Isn't that the picture that we see today? Pushing God out of the picture. Okay, what happens? But they became vain in their imaginations. Notice, and their foolish heart was darkened. The minute that a man denies God, he becomes foolish. And their heart become darkened. And verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? There's no doubt God's word is quite clear in this. In spite of all the intelligence that man can strum together, when man denies God, is a fool, according to Scripture. They profess themselves to be wise, and they may be well be schooled in the ways of man, but the minute they deny the existence of God, they become fools. And they changed 
the glory of the uncorruptible God into the, an image made like unto corruptible men or birds and full fruited beasts and creeping things. If you please, these were many of the idols and the shapes and animal shapes that, that man gave to their idols, calling them God. Remember, worshipping the creature more than the creator. And this is how man has changed the image of the incorruptible eternal God into that of corruptible things. Where, therefore, because of this, God also gave them up to uncleanliness through the lusts of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Once a person, once a society denies God, there is a breakdown of their morals. God says, okay, so I don't exist? Well, let's see what you can do without me. Let's see what you do without my laws. And inevitably, man's morals spiral down and disappear. Man becomes self-serving, selfish, self-destructive, violent, uh, well, totally consumed with self and in every way saddened and absolutely self-destroying. And so, you see, it, God gives them up to dishonor their own bodies between themselves because they changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. If you read on, you'll find that God gave them up to their own vile lust, to a reprobate mind. And you watch in every society that abandons the truth of theism, the worship of the one true God, there is this spiraling where eventually the distinction between man and woman is lost. And aren't we seeing that in society today? The desires of man and woman sexually turn to each other. That's what we're seeing in society today. So the very effects that the Bible says are the results of the denial of God we are seeing in our society because our society is denying the one true God. Oh, there's a lot of spirituality out there. A great deal of God talk, but not of the one true God, not of the values of the scriptures. And so they are given up by God to their own lusts. Our next slide says eight arguments for the existence of God. So if ever you are looking at a discussion with somebody about how do you know God exists and you have to demonstrate in some way or another from a way apart from what we've already read in scriptures, this will help you to be able to argue the point. Brother Gordon. Sorry, Brother Max, I was, I was trying to get in before you finished the last sure. point. Yep. Because I read the rest of that um, um, Psalm 14, verse 1. I thought it was said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done <laughs> ab abominable works. Yeah. There is none that doeth good. Interesting. So the minute there is a denial of God, you notice what happens? Men's nature deteriorates, corrupts becomes abominable. And that's exactly what we see in Romans. So there's a very good correlation. Thank you, Brother Gordon. That's a good link between Psalms. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And Romans chapter 1. Make a note of that in your notes. It's a, it's a good way to study the Word of God to make sure that you connect one verse with the other. Praise the Lord. But you can see that God is very clear. He will bless us if we believe in Him. But the natural result of a denial of God is the deterioration and ultimate corruption and abomination of humanity. And by the way, humans, unlike animals, are the only created being that can become less than an animal, lower than an animal. Animals are created in a certain level and they seem to stay within that range. But humans can excel to be amazing creatures, and yet they can, and you don't have to read your paper to see this, they can become lower than animals in their behavior, in their desires, and so forth. Why is this? Because we can either use our faith, in our innate faith, to believe in God and be blessed of Him, or we can turn against God and deny God, in which case we become abominable and corrupt. Eight arguments for the existence of God. Let's go through these quickly tonight. We're not going to keep you very long. And please, I want to, uh, to say before we even start on this, the fact that you are saved today, the fact that you have tasted of God personally, is your greatest evidence for the existence of God. This is only so that you are aware that there are other ways that you know the existence of God can be logically demonstrated. And there is a lot more that can be said about this topic if you want to study further. But first of all, let's have a look at this. The first uh, argument is the universality of the belief that God exists. We've covered this to some degree. We have stated that virtually everywhere in the world, 
there is an innate knowledge that God exists. And this in itself is a, a, an evidence of the existence of God. I mean, how, how does a person that's never been taught about God know that God is? Uh, they may not call him Jesus, but they know that a God exists and they worship a God. So who's put this here? And this is the question that cannot be answered except to understand that God exists. So the fact that man everywhere believes in a God is a very strong argument in favor of its truth. This universal belief comes from within. Man is born with it and it's universal. It's worldwide. So go where you want to, anywhere in the world, even in places where Christianity has never reached and there will be a worship of God. So this is our first argument, is that because everywhere there is this innate knowledge, then it couldn't exist except God put it there. All right. Here is another interesting one. It's a, it's called the argument from cause, and it's uh, otherwise known scientifically as a cosmological argument. And this argues that there is a cause for everything. In other words, if this building exists, do you believe this building exists? How do you know it exists? How do you know it's not a figment of your imagination, Brother Bill? I have cold feet sitting on the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> People will argue all sorts of silly things, but the fact is, you are conscious when something exists. I mean, if you are rational, and you are kind of all right up there in the head, you know when something is real and it exists, and when something doesn't, okay? So the fact that this building exists means that It's an effect, so it must have come from a cause. It must have been something, someone, that put it there. And that's a very good argument. So, if we can find anything that exists, we have to say, well, where did it come from? How did it come about? Man, the universe around us are all effects. Nothing is self-causing. Have a look at it. Nothing is self-causing. There has to be a, a seed in order for a plant to grow. Well, where did the seed come from? And so in the first place, there has to be a cause if we are to find an effect. So if you will reason this way, and this is a very strong argument, everything that exists is an effect. So therefore, there is a cause that created that. Well, who or what is that cause? And of course, evolution attempts to say that these things happen by random processes. And they've made all sorts of stipulations and changes and so forth to their theory and they've stated simply that if enough time goes by anything can just develop pretty much but there are many people of course now uh, seeing that that is not the case and uh, and it is nevertheless yet a theory what we believe is that if something exists the cause is God it has to be something greater than the effect someone more powerful than the effect Someone outside of the effect, someone that doesn't need to be caused in himself. And God is the only one that fits that argument. So, for instance, if we were to walk into a library and we were to see shelf upon shelf of of books, would you be in your right mind to say, oh, well, they just appeared? Because you know very well that that doesn't happen. Every shelf somebody had to build Every book, someone had to write, and then someone had to print it, and someone had to put it together to exist in the format that it has. The logical conclusion is that if something exists, therefore there must be a cause for that something. And we reason this way about everything. Let me show you an example. Let's assume that you are in the middle of nowhere, and uh, you're not in a city, there is no house anywhere, so you're in the bush, and maybe you're walking through where there are trees and birds and all this type of thing. And there, in the middle of the bush, on the ground, you find a red peg. And you kick it around and look and you say, what is this? And you pick it up and you say, well, look at that. It's a peg. Does that belong in nature? Why not? Don't pigs grow on trees? (laughs) Okay. So, what are some of the acceptable or reasonable assumptions that we could make, having found such a simple object in the middle of a bush or a desert somewhere. What's a rational or reasonable assumption that we can make? <laughs> Someone's been here before. This doesn't grow on trees. It just doesn't happen in nature. We know that. So what does it represent? Just something like this. What does it say straight away to you? There's another human being. You didn't put it there. It doesn't grow on trees. What is your rational, logical conclusion? Someone else exists. I never saw a human. All I saw was a pig 
But because it is an effect, it tells me that someone caused this effect. Now then, if we go down the path, we begin to look at this thing. You know what? It's got a spring in it. It's designed in a certain way to bite and hold on to things. It's a very simple object, but it has a purpose. Would you say it's been designed, thought through? Somebody thought, I want to hold, you know, clothes on the line. I need something that will open up and go around the line and hold my clothes. Guess what? It's been designed to grab clothes. It's simple, right? But it's a design. What does that tell you now about the individual that you haven't met, you haven't seen, you ha- you don't even know that, that he exists in the sense that you haven't seen him personally, but you know he exists because the evidence is there. What does it tell you about that individual that made this? Um, you'd have to have more brains than that pig. <laughs> <laughs> the pig didn't make itself, and he can't be a pig, or he can't be uh, equal to the pig. He has to be greater than the pig. We're merely describing a human here, but notice the same logical reasoning applies. So if you find a simple pig, you can determine two things. Another human exists, and somebody made it. And whoever made it could reason, could think, could design. And then if you really want to go to to town on this, let's have a look at the material. We're talking plastics. Where does that come from? And we're talking a metal spring that continues to spring in and out. It's a particular type of metal. This is not just a simple something that could happen anyhow. How thought, purpose, design went into designing this simple object that you found in the bush. Now, can you with some confidence say another human being exists? The evidence is a pig. You never saw the other human being. Yet, using the same logical structure... Individuals look at not a pig, but a tree, a flower, a human being, and all that is created and say, God doesn't exist. It just happened by accident. Now, how many people would believe that a pig just happened by itself over millions of years? I don't think so. And yet they say the structures by far more complex happen by accident. But I am ahead of myself. I'm starting to cover the next argument. And that's the argument from design, the teleological argument. These two go hand in hand. You see, if there is an effect, there is a cause. And the cause is always greater than the effect. It's always greater than the creation. So we can rest assured that if the creation is a pig, whoever created it is greater than the pig. And if the creation is a human, then whoever created the human must be what? He has to be greater than the human. And this is where... This argument comes in. It's the argument from design, the teleological argument. The structure of a watch proves that only, not only a maker, but a designer exists. And the universe and nature prove that there is a superintending and originating intelligence and will. In more recent times, this argument has been strengthened by, interestingly, not Christian scientists or believers, but by individuals who, in fact, are not in themselves creationists, but who, in studying the human form, have had to say, this is impossible, it couldn't just happen. You see, sometimes in the past, when they looked through a microscope, all they could see in the cell was basically this this jelly blob, you know, that was floating around our body fluids. They couldn't see inside the cell. They couldn't really understand what was going on. But since electron microscopes and, and much research, we're beginning to understand that this little blob, by the way, it, about one-tenth of the size of a pin, that's the size of a human cell that is in your, in your blood. And yet inside that, there are literally billions of organisms and functioning structures, perfectly designed, so complex and so amazing that that little cell is in itself shouting, God is. And what has happened is that we've got biologists like, for instance, Michael B. here, biochemist, who now says, you know what, and he's written a book, by the way, he says the, he's written a book called The Biological Challenge to Evolution. And by the way, the man is not a Christian in itself or a creationist, he, but he does advocate intelligent design. He says it is impossible for these structures to just have occurred naturally. It's like saying, this doesn't grow on trees. That's a fair statement. Somebody made it. What he is saying is, when you take the structures and you look at how they function, and you reduce it to the the basic parts, there is an irreducible complexity. And this is his terminology. You cannot break it beyond a certain point and the thing keep working. 
And because the parts of the cell and so forth are so perfect and so functional and so forth, he says, there has to be an intelligent mind that has designed this. It's too perfect. It can't just happen. Of course, he may not say it was God, but we know that it is God. Some, and even uh, postulated now, that it's, it's some kind of alien life from either space that's created all this. But you know what? They're still hard up finding these aliens. They've made lots of movies about them, but there's no evidence of any, either life in outer space anywhere. But we do know of outer life, and he isn't an alien. He's God, and he's created all of us. Another man who uh, has done a very good work on this, and by the way, I'm just, in case you're not aware, you probably are. His name is Lee Strobel. He has uh, written some uh, terrific books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, and The Case for Creator, and more recently, a book called The Case for the True Christ, because there are many false Christs out there. And a, a lot of his material is now available on DVD, um, and it's a, an abbreviated or a summarized form of his book. And it's really worth um, <laughs> watching some of this material. This man was an atheist. He was brought up as, as an evolutionist, and of course he believed that we just happened over millions of years. But he began to question, as a, in fact, he worked as a, uh, an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. And uh, in 1980, after his wife became converted to Christianity, um, he saw the effects of God in, his, in her life. And he began to question, he began to say, does the contemporary scientific evidence point towards or away from a supernatural God? And he began to ask questions. He wanted answers. And he asked some tough questions. And he got some terrific answers. As a result of this, he became converted. And in 1981, only a year later, he became the legal, he was an award-winning legal editor of the Chicago Tribune and uh, has since published all these books which demonstrate this theological argument very well if you will just have a read of some of his material or get a hold of the DVD. It's called The Case for a Creator, particularly good material, and it will help you to understand a little bit more what we're talking about here. Let me move on because I'm running out of time. Sorry, Gordon. It's also available on audio. Yeah, tremendous. Yes, it is. In fact, it is very, very good if you like to listen to the book instead of reading it. It will help. Uh, A lot of material in, in the books, by the way. I need to hurry very quickly. An argument from being, this is simply the fact that man has an idea of an infinite and perfect being. This idea did not come from ourselves. Therefore, such a being must exist and cannot be just a mere thought. Um, every Once again, we are saying that man has the necessity to worship, but also there is an idea in minds of humans everywhere that an infinite and perfect being exists. Again, uh, we could spend a lot of time on that, but just simply the argument from being is called the ontological argument. Okay, here's another, and this is an important one. Um, we all believe in morality in one sense or another. Sadly, many are abandoning the morality of the Bible, but I want you to know that morality is obligatory. It is something that is not optional, and man has an intellectual and moral nature. Even in our society, which denies God, it is wrong to go up to someone and kill them. Why? Why is this wrong? People will tell you it's immoral, it's it's wrong, it's right. But why is it wrong? And they may give all sorts of reasons, but ultimately, if we are honest, the only reason that we can really give is because God says it's wrong. And that's the only true reason. God, who is an authority outside of created, uh, uh, that which has been created, He is the cause, has said that that is wrong, that's sinful. You don't do that. And as a result, we have this innate knowledge that this is wrong. And to this day, in spite of a society that denies God, if a person kills another person, they're put in prison, they're punished, because it's immoral. So can you see that there is a a morality which is obligatory within man? And even though it is breaking down, it is a very strong argument, because if God doesn't exist, then how do we measure morality? Where do we get it from? And what is right and wrong? And why is it wrong to kill someone else? Well, if this idea is inbuilt in man, and remember, man cannot make himself, and whoever made him must be greater and outside of man, then the being that made man must be moral. Remember the, the pig? We, we can do, so deduce all sorts of things, because this requires design, materials. And so if the creature, being man now, has a moral consciousness, then the one that made him must be greater than the made thing. 
So therefore we deduce that God is a being that is not only eternal, but is a being of goodness and power and love and wisdom and holiness and that has an emotional consciousness and a nature and only such a being can satisfy this moral argument. If that's not the case, then where did man get morality from? Let's answer it. And you will find that there is no other answer. No human nature, no human race, no human group can come up with a, an answer unless we accept that there is a creator who is intellectual, moral, a uh, moral being, a judge, and a lawgiver. And when we start to read the word of God, we quickly discover it. God said, thou shall not kill. He has built it within us. The law is written right there. Praise God. All right, very quickly. An argument from congruity. Congruity. If something is congruent, what does it mean? Yes. Equal, yeah, okay, it's good. Sh show me a key. Does anybody have a key on you? Brother Gordon, come on, you've got to have a key. There it is. There's a key. That key is congruent to a lock. In other words, it fits. Okay? The argument from congruity is this. You, you can have a lock and you can try many keys and they won't open it, but then one key will open that lock. It is congruent with the lock. It fits. Now, the point is this. When you have a look at what fits what we see in nature, what fits when we see creation, we find that God and what he says in his word is congruent with what we find in nature. In other words, when man approaches nature and says, what does this say? Does it say that God exists or does it say that God does not? What is congruent is that God exists. Nature says God exists. And this is what the Bible teaches us also. So congruity means that we have a key that fits the lock. When we have a belief in a self-existent personal God, we have something that is in harmony with our mental nature, with our moral nature, with the entire world around us. And if God exists, all of the questions regarding creation, religion, nature, human history, they're all answered. It fits. The key fits. But take evolution. Does it fit? No. Evolution cannot explain how morality came about. Evolution cannot explain to you why it's wrong to kill your fellow man. Evolution cannot explain many, many things, but God can. God is the key that fits. So therefore, the argument from congruity is a very powerful one. Uh, we have, of course, the argument from Scripture, and this is very powerful, but I hardly have to uh, spend any time on this to demonstrate to you that the Scripture proves God. You know He exists. I am speaking to those that believe in God, but the Scripture and the history of the Jews and all the fulfilled prophecy and all that has happened in the Scriptures would be unexplainable without God. So the fact that the scriptures exist, the prophecies exist, and they, these things have come to pass, all says God exists. Praise the Lord. The arguments are arguments of logic and all quite sound. However, this is probably the more definitive and far more effective, the fact that this is the word of God and it says God is, and this is what we put our faith in. Lastly, and I do want to cover this because it is an important one, perhaps one would say this is not a scientific argument, but really it is a very valid argument. We call it the argument of first person, or personal experience, or, if you please, being a witness. For instance, let's say that we were here in a court of law, and somebody was being tried for a murder, and amongst the people there was someone who said, I was there and I saw this man kill this person. Would you think that that individual would hold some kind of sway on the decision of the court? Why? Why is that so important? Yes. He's a witness, right? And to our way of thinking, someone who can state and make a statement that they were there, they saw and they personally experienced that what they saw and they're willing to tell about it, uh, it counts for something. And it counts all too often in our courts of law for bringing about a judgment. Well, the personal experience for the Christian is a very important. Every Christian can testify of many experiences that he has had with a personal living God. Isn't it good that we've got those experiences? Praise the Lord. Okay, God answers prayers. Can you say amen? amen. All right, God has answered my prayers. He's answered yours. The fact that men praise and prayers are answered are an example of a personal 
ex experience of the existence of God. God has answered my prayer. When God saves the soul of a sinner, have you been saved? Have you been changed? Uh, you know the, the newness of life that comes in Christ. You know that this is not just a religious emotion, but a power of God being experienced in you of where you're having your sins remitted and the sinful habits broken and in being born again. God demonstrates that He is. He exists. Okay, has anybody here been healed? Has God touched your body? You've been healed, touched of God. Beautiful, isn't it? Again, evidence that God is real. You prayed and God produced a miracle in your life and you knew that He is real. Man has fellowship with God. This is probably to me the most strong of evidences. I can have a relationship with God every day, every moment of the day. I speak with Him. He speaks with me. People may want to look me up as a, as a loony bean, but I'm telling you, God is real. I know He's real. He's real in my soul. Praise God. Well, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. With all the evidence, with all creation shouting, with all the design, with everything that is around us, how could he ever deny the existence of the one true God? Hallelujah. Will you stand with me?